and actually that's because I did that for my thesis. But uh, she's an annoyance, um, and uh, she inter she's interfering. She's she's uh, she says the wrong thing. She gets into trouble, and she laughs at anything. She doesn't take anything seriously, and that's the problem, of course, because you know it gets into a lot of trouble with several people. Uh, and it ends up with her offending a couple of people who, you know, a uh, couple of people who she likes, her friends. She, she offends their feelings because of that. But she said, I mean, Jane Austen said that that's the one person that I like best, and uh, you know, I, which I think nobody else would like. And I think that's the spirit of what she she's like. I think yeah. Emma is kind of like what she's like, and which is why I would say that Matthew Park. I see that as she makes fun of everybody, gets into a little bit of trouble. But that's the point. You know, that's 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 her. That's that's the, the idea. I think uh, Elizabeth Bennet is is probably the most popular. That's for sure. Um, but so she's she's the most identifiable. I yeah, think. but she actually didn't for the sheer force much that about uh, right. you know. I mean, right. she said a couple of things about her being light, bright, and that's you know that's her description of the the novel uh, Pride and Prejudice itself. Uh, but it was a very yeah. I, I took me by surprise as well in one of her letters. What was that corrected? I thought yeah. he, he said, I thought yeah. something <laughs> that she said, yeah. uh, Elizabeth was her yeah. neighbor. I have a quotation here, yeah. in which she says something about yeah. uh, Anne Elliot, I remember. Mm. She wrote to her niece, uh, Anne Austin, and she said, you may perhaps like the heroine referring to Anne Elliot, as she is almost too good for me. I thought it's, a, it's an interesting commentary yeah. on the women that yeah. she, 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 she has created, yeah. the extent to which she uh, uh, offered closeness to uh, the people that she has, she has created. I wanted to sort of raise a question, if I may. Oh, of course. It's yes, <laughs> yes, about, about <coughs> movies and, and, and books. Of course, the, the thing is, I don't think they're comparable because they're mm, no. different. Media, but I saw the Kira Knightley version, which mm -hmm. May doesn't like, mm -hmm. and I kind of like it because I thought it brought in a modern and almost uh, what is it, dark, almost like Wuthering Heights version mm. into uh, a, a, a fight <laughs> and prejudice. Because one of the things that I find fascinating about uh, the language of Jane Austen is that there is a lot of emotion not expressed yeah. and what is not expressed quite often is stronger uh, than True. what is expressed. I think uh, she puts some minds into uh, into Eleanor which I think makes it quite clear and of course sense of sensibility um, is, a, is, is the beginning. May I read something from that? I would love it if you did. Yeah. That would be fabulous. I think we'd all enjoy that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's a bit of dialogue where, uh, okay, uh, Marion uh, expresses, uh, says that, uh, sorry, yeah, Marion says that Eleanor's attitude towards Edward is kind of, uh, you know, not strongly expressed and she says, uh, Eleanor started at this declaration and was sorry for the warmth she had been betrayed into, into in speaking of him. She felt that Edward stood very high in her opinion. She believed the regard to be mutual, but she required greater certainty of it to make Marion's condition of their attachment agreeable to her. She knew that what Marion and her mother conjectured one moment they believed the next. That with them to wish was to hope and to hope was to expect. She tried to explain the real state, the real state of the case to her sister. I do not attempt to deny, said she, that I think very highly of him, that I generally esteem that I like him. Marion here burst forth with indignation. Esteem him? Like him? Cold hearted Eleanor. Oh, Worse than cold-hearted, ashamed of being otherwise. Use these words again, and I will leave the room this moment. <laughs> Eleanor could not help laughing. 
excuse me, said she, and be assured that I mean no offence to you by speaking in so quiet a way of my own feelings. Believe them to be stronger than I have declared. I think this gives me a clue as to the the, uh, the fact that in post-colonial mm, mm. theory they talk they say they say that silence is sometimes more mm. it speaks more strongly than than what is expressed. How will we how will we appreciate Austin um, as our appetite for words starts to wane and we prefer visual medium? and as bookshops start disappearing, will we need the visual medium to remind people of the books? Mm. <laughs> Melissa looks like she's slightly <laughs> mortified <laughs> by that concept. <laughs> and, that, um, and that's the point. Actually, yeah, right? I, and I just want to add a comment because uh, Robert was saying something about the, uh, the atmospheric quality of the, the movie, the Karen Knightley, and I think he's, he's hit on something which is possibly one of the reasons why I didn't quite like it, you know. Uh, I think you've hit on something which I didn't occur to me earlier on. Um, I, I think that if you're going to do an Austin movie, you can't put a Bronte-esque quality mm. to it <laughs> because Bronte, the Brontes hated Austin, yeah. Uh, they, it was, yeah, they really couldn't stand each other. I mean, she, you know, they made comments about how, uh, you know, she with her suffocating little rooms and all these <laughs> women, you know, they made comments about it. And they said things like, um, you know, give us our free space and our, you know, wanderings throughout the malls of New York. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, they, they're kind of directly opposed to each other. So I can't imagine the film, I mean, of course, now they have that film with that atmospheric quality about it. I can understand the rationale behind it, but mm. it doesn't sit well with me because it's yeah. not what Austin, yeah. you know, you need that closed space, which is why Ang Lee to me is still brilliant because he had that idea of closed space and he even had in some of his shots it's almost the theatrical yeah you had that idea of a room and then he pans out and it, it's like a room and another yep. room and another room you get yep. these um, you know those Russian doll type of effects yep. here in, in that uh, in that screen um, so you know that that's um, that that's the issue I, I have with, with uh, that particular uh, movie but uh, you're right I mean uh, you know the, the point is, uh, my worry is, if the movies are the access point into the text, who's going to bother reading the text? Yeah. Um, and will they ever bother yeah. reading, reading the text? Yeah. And also because of the language, um, some people may find that the, the, the sentences, I mean the construction of the sentences are very long. Yeah. Uh, they're long, they are convoluted, they contain several clauses built into clauses. And I know students have the great difficulty reading that. Um, you know, because of that, yeah, well, just to read the, the sentences. But the <coughs> thing is that when they do get it, I mean, the, the satisfaction is just I immense, mm. you know. Um, but so when it doesn't come from an academic perspective, and also, you know, will, th will all these references of, of class and, and a time mm. long gone, mm. how, how, how will we have people move past that to see the broader theme? I'll give you a point of view on that. Um, uh, let me think about that one. So anyone has <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just simply I'll how do we continue to keep it relevant? To focus mm. on love and marriage. I, I think, think that is to that's me very central. To that's a good point because that is eternal. Those are eternal themes. Mm. I, think it's I think it's really important, maybe I'm just going to make a little plug here, for teachers to keep teaching it. I think it's critical that teachers make a conscious decision mm. that we're going to teach this because for too long we've been told that these texts and I know because you know we work in a system where we hear this all the time they, they tell you that, that the texts are difficult uh, certain students can do it other students can't mm. and I think that that's the wrong way to start from I think I if you have teachers with the passion who are going out to teach the text and who are going to explain this and to get students involved uh, you will keep the text alive yeah, and it doesn't need to be in competition with the film. Mm. What you were saying about the classes, I mean, really, in a sense, that's out of date. I mean, completely yeah. out of date anyway. Women have independence, but there's always going to be disparity. You know, nobody's there's never going to be an equal world, and so I think even if we can't recognise that, I mean, a world with eldest sons and um, where you know, one son gets everything and the daughters are trying to, you know, sew shirts together and 
and darn stockings and, and desperately trying to make ends meet um, because they can have independence now but there's always going to be you know the haves and the have nots and I think we can always identify that in there and what you were saying about the irrelevance of the text maybe in time to come uh, in a way I mean I don't know what other people feel but I watch classics sometimes that I haven't read like Dickens or something yeah. which I, I find I find Dickens less accessible but I then look for the book so um, I think sometimes it is still an attraction mm -hmm. um, yes. and you want to read it because you enjoyed it so much and it suddenly ended and you want to be able to relive that and so you go to the I hope my, my hope is that Jane Austen will go the way of Shakespeare Shakespeare has been kept yeah. alive because of um, varying interpretations, cross-cultural interpretations, yeah. um, and uh, you know, I mean, just the, the in, in the fifties alone. I mean, uh, you know, in fifties and sixties, Kurosawa himself kept uh, the entire Absolutely. Shakespeare industry alive. Yeah. You know, um, so we're hoping that that's going to be the way to go for Jane Austen, with of course with the Bollywood interpretations, uh, with of course if you have a Taiwanese director, there's no reason why you can't have a Chinese interpretation. Um, maybe that's the way to go. I think that must be the way because um, the lens, the different lenses need to be applied so that people who are going to only access it a certain way will have those doors of access. I'd like to open it up to all of you now um, to any questions that you have or any discussion points that you'd like to throw up. Anyone? Have we brought up for you anything? Yes. Yep. That's a great question. Can we apply some of the values to transmitting to another to a modern society? Reflective of Asian society or Western society? Mm. I saw the movie Bride and Prejudice with Ashwari Rai. Yes. Indian mother with yeah. four Indian daughters married a European. His prejudice later changed. Yeah. How relevant <laughs> okay. uh, I think uh, the characters are still real and how and I've just been uh, rereading Mansfield Park and sometimes there's this um, <coughs> the way she slices off as Melissa slices off heads <coughs> off characters and you, you look at the character something Mary Crawford says and this sort of artifice there and superficiality and scheming and you think have I ever done that in my life? Have I ever been like Mary Crawford? <laughs> and I think um, all her characters, you sort of think, oh, I know someone who's a bit like that. And, <laughs> and even though Jane Austen actually said that, uh, I'm not sure that she did say, but um, her family recognized that although she lived in this very colorful, um, she knew so many people, and even though she lived in some kind of like a, a small village, she would uh, travel and stay with relatives and then she went to Bath and she actually moved in lots of different societies and amongst very rich and also she helped the poor and so she had um, a huge kind of palette to draw from but she didn't actually draw anything exactly from life um, mm. a lot of it was in her imagination but there are sort of parallels and things but I think there's so <coughs> many characters that we can actually recognize and human nature is still is still the same so I feel there's a relevance in the way our attitudes towards the kind of um, zealous suitor who's not suitable and mm. you know all this kind of thing I mean they're still there and Catherine Morland's excitement her first ball is like the first <coughs> disco or the first time you're allowed to yeah. wear makeup and this kind of thing it's exactly the same in from you know from one level uh, with how <coughs> the girls are then or were then um, so that yeah that's a little bit Robert to your point then so about uh, some of the internal that, that I have I have, I have two daughters, they are <coughs> married now, uh, they have children, but uh, when they were uh, <coughs> thinking or settling down, uh, my wife in particular was very concerned uh, that they uh, marry well, and for her, more than for me, uh, it was important to marry well in, in terms of marrying wealth, or relative wealth, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Well, someone at least who can provide <coughs> you with an HDB apartment. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, uh, strictly speaking, I mean, you, you st we still, uh, in particularly now in times of high inflation, I think you have, if you're a young 
woman, you have to be concerned about these things. Mm. And, and, and the perennial problem that Jane Austen's novels pose is do you as a young woman marry for love? Or, do you, uh, or I wouldn't say or, and as well as mm, if you can balance it, marry for practical reasons. Mm. It's not an either or thing, it seems to me. Her <laughs> wisdom is that it's not sense or sensibility, but it's sense and sensibility, marrying the two. And that, I think, if you can balance the two, uh, will be one insurance of uh, happiness, at least up to the time when they marry. What happens afterwards uh, is another story. You know? So I <laughs> think that is, uh, that is the her relevance uh, for me. The enduring relevance. The enduring relevance there, yeah. Melissa. Um, well, the thing about the, the, the text, um, it's really hard to say that, you know, uh, what, what lessons can, can we learn from it, what values can we learn from it, because a lot of people talk about the novels being didactic, um, you know, about the novels trying to, to teach people certain values, and I think, you, again, you, you try and look for that, you're kind of missing the point. Um, <coughs> it, it, Jane Austen was writing against a particular <coughs> kind of novel uh, that we call the sentimental novel. Okay, um, I think what you know about the sentimental novel, it's really, uh, really bad sort of, uh <laughs> you know, um, very uh, overly sentimentalized, very overly melodramatic type of writing that was in existence in the 18th century, and she was actually critiquing it. Now, the sentimental novels are known for being really didactic. They're always about some virtuous young woman, you know, who refuses to give in to some man until they get married and they can have sex. But, you know, um, it, it's always <laughs> sentimental novels are like that. And the point behind it was because it was aimed towards teaching young, young women uh, proper values. And uh, a lot of Jane Austen's writing was actually against that. Uh, she was writing to critique the sentimental novel to a large extent. So I think um, when you ask about the values that... <laughs> I think she'd have a bit of a laugh with that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you talk about the values that her novel is trying to impart. Uh, I also think that uh, you, you kind of, you know, it, it's more about having a good laugh. Uh, and she's critiquing a lot of people. It was meant to be more of a critique, I, I feel, uh, rather than actual imparting of values. Yeah. And uh, to, to sort of suggest to, uh, I mean, at why it's endured is because it has that really entertaining, entertaining element about it, about being able to critique uh, in a... Um, in a good-hearted fashion, I mean, people don't realize how nasty it is. Uh, it looks like it's gentle and kind, but actually it is quite uh, uh, insidious and nasty uh, critique. Um, but it's also been entertaining because of that. Uh, so I don't think we should look for, look too hard for the values or, or to come out from no. it. Although Robert is right about this thing that she, you know, she did prize this balance between sense and sensibility, and she was trying to say about the optimum, uh, you know, the, 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 the best person is the person that can balance all these attributes in one person. Basically, she was just trying to say, let's not get too excessive and carry the way we think, you see, restraint and everything, and, you know, that's the way to live, rather than just adopting one extreme uh, belief system or another. But well, the reference to values will change yeah. over time yeah, anyway, right. yeah. as, we, as we change as people and as societies change. But I think those themes, mm. some of those themes that we talked yeah. about that are universal mm -hmm. and eternal will probably continue to carry through. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Um, do you see any of the commonalities I mean, you know, the different between autism and like private prejudice and uh, homo-homo have, <laughs> have any of you read the of the Red Chamber. I've, I've read it uh, in abbreviated version right. a long time ago. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm able to to comment, but I think if you look at Jane Austen, say for uh, most societies which are not class bound, <coughs> you, you probably think that the class bound consciousness mm. in Jane Austen is not not relevant. But I, I think that if you concentrate. You don't forget forget about the, uh, the class because I think she was not. Uh, I think she's not terribly sort of class conscious. It seems to me, although she, uh, her characters have to be class conscious because mm. they have to marry well. Mm. Um, but if you focus on what is seems to be central to her, love, marriage, uh, 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 people who are sincere, 
people who are insincere, you know, the villains in her, uh, in her, in her novels, people like uh, Mr. Collins, he's not a villain, but he's mm. he, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a stupid dumb fellow, and, and then Wickham, <laughs> Wickham, Willoughby, and so on. I, I think these characters still speak to us today, and the yeah. class, the class is not, not important. So did she write archetypes that, en that endure, it, would you say? It, in almost in a way that Shakespeare did as well, because when you when you look back to it, sometimes even as writers, it's almost like there's a formula for you. There's the arc. That's how the st that's how this character goes through their their journey. Um, and people use Shakespeare as a reference point. Does Austen present that as well? Well, when Shakespeare was writing, uh, Shakespeare in himself is considered subversive because. Shakespeare was, was taking a formula and he subverted that formula, whether it was uh, the genre of the tragedy, the comedy or the history play, because there are elements uh, mm. of, of subversion in all, those, in all those genres. So I like to think that Jane Austen did the same thing as well. She was taking a type, which is, like I said, the sentimental novel, uh, the medieval romance, um, the, 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 the realist novel, all these different types that were in existence, and she kind of turned it around as well. Mm. You know, um, so I think that's kind of probably that's the best formula because uh, Shakespeare did it, she did it as well. Uh, the two most subversive people, uh, you would ask me in English, you know, writing in, in literary history, would be the two of them. They took something and they turned it around. Um, so that might be your formula for endurance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Talking about Jane Austen enduring and stuff like that, she's really leapt into popular culture recently. I don't know whether you've noticed Jane Austen and zombies. Darcy yeah. Vampire Hunter, Sense oh and Sea yeah. Monsters. There's also a porn version. Oh my god, so I'm not I'm surprised. Not <laughs> <laughs> Darcy Digglesworth, oh god knows. You know I mean? So any any thoughts about about that? It's also the Lizzie Bennet Diaries and yes. it's a yeah. on YouTube. Yeah. 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 And yep. uh, I think there's quite a following amongst people who don't actually even quite know what it what mm. the source is. Uh, not into these. I think uh, somebody was, I think my son, who's uh, 20, I think he, he was saying this, is uh, so it the same person who did the, um, the Lincoln Vampire mm. film, the recent oh, one? Okay. Is it the same? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, all I know is that I'm seeing all these books with, you know, Darcy Vampire Hunter and stuff like that, and I'm like, God, <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> I think you know you hit that level of popularity yeah, exactly. when you get turned into a vampire. Yeah, I, <laughs> 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 you know? yeah. I think oh, apparently yeah. those are quite well written, but they're I'm absolutely they're hot. They're selling like hot cakes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah. yeah. I, I mean, there is something in that, in what Melissa said, unfortunately. <laughs> Stick a pair of fangs on anything and it is apparent and you know, drain the colour out of someone and yeah. that is going to make it for in popularity a little bit. Jane Austen might have liked that. Well, you sound a tad irked by it. We shall hope that this trend stops. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest, I haven't read any, any of them. I probably should go and pick one up. I'm, I'm, I'm a purist. I was like, eek, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go and find one. Maybe next year we do this again. I'll come back. <laughs> 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 It's a fear of being popular. Like <laughs> yeah, that. absolutely. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes. Yeah. I watch it with my daughter. 
That is a little bit of a factor of um, the way the medium changes and and the consumer appetite, the audience appetite. I think we are going to to see that language become simplified. H how do purists feel about that? Well, I, I don't know. I remember when the Kira Knightley um, one came out, and there's a young Singaporean girl who I knew who wasn't particularly literary and she watched both versions and she said well actually I really prefer the BBC version and I think people um, possibly can recognise that something's missing um, with that simplified language and I think as long as we can understand and with Shakespeare sometimes you don't actually understand the lines but if they're well acted uh, then yeah. you do so yeah. <laughs> yeah so I think uh, there's, there's always going but to be that but we've also seen Shakespeare go through that transformation mm -hmm. as well the Bad Lerman presentation of Romeo and Juliet opened Shakespeare up to a whole audience who had been in their mind Shakespeare was about the delivery of lines in this manner you know and and now they were seeing Shakespeare in a very modern context but the lines were still mm -hmm. the original lines um, just delivered differently yeah. Because actually, with the Kira Knightley one that she was going to watch, but um, they're actually given new lines which aren't in the book, and it's like, well, there are lines there already. Why do you have to make up new ones? You know, how can you be pretentious and think you're better than Jane Austen? Well, um, I know that the BBC versions, right? I mean, the BBC versions of most things, especially if they were out in the 70s or the 80s. They were actually mostly for yeah for pedagogical purposes. The BBC was making all these mm. films so that they could you know send it off to schools and the students were watching it instead of just reading the text. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's why it also retained a lot of the original uh, lines and they, they wanted that sort of uh, they, I mean they wanted that that authenticity and that uh, closeness to the text. Yeah. Uh, whereas films, I mean, they produce for different reasons. Um, the director likes to put his own interpretation yeah. onto the thing, uh, rather than just for, you know, for educational purposes. So that's possibly a reason why it's changed as well. Tell us about this Jane Austen circle. Yeah. I'm sorry, let me have to go. Yes, we're going to do the last question, and um, and then we ha we do have to wrap as well because I think there's a movie about to be screened. Tell us about this. Circle. Uh, well, a friend, um, yes. a friend from Bath uh, started it about 18 months ago. We're not actually officially a registered society uh, because we're actually more interested in Jane Austen than kind of uh, meetings and, and minutes and that kind of thing. But we put on, um, we do dramatised readings in costume, and we love other people uh, coming to uh, to watch and, and join in. We, we, uh, one of the ladies who's part of it, unfortunately, some they haven't been able to be here tonight, but she's in US, but she uh, teaches minuet. And um, so the people who've been, um, a few people here who've actually been coming along to things. Uh, so we do dramatized reading in costume. We don't actually learn the words, but we actually <laughs> do it with a, with a script, which is very close to the, the text. We just slightly, uh, we have to make it into script form. And we've done, uh, we have cream teas and we had a little dinner. Um, so we try um, and, and we raise money for orphans at the same time and have a lot of fun. Um, you can find us on Facebook, although our most recent event, which was in March, <laughs> I haven't uploaded the photos yet, but um, if you look up Jane Austen Circle at Singapore on Facebook, you can find it and you can see some photos and then. Um, I think we'll be having, we're hoping to have a big event in September. So, um, and you can message uh, the Facebook page, or um, and then we can uh, get your email details and put you on the mailing list and let you know. That's a great place to leave it. Thank you so much. So, um, look up the circle if you want to continue and take this love affair a little further. This love affair with Austin that we all have have had for many years and continue to have. And so enjoy the screening that's coming up and all that's left is for me to thank Melissa, Robert and Margie for giving their time and, um, and so freely of their, their thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the movie and thank you to the audience.